Christie was found dead, the family had planned to bathe in their jacuzzi before construction crews arrived to continue renovation of the home's washrooms. Chris and Christy woke up early and went to bathe around 6 a.m. They attempted to wake their daughter, but she would not get up, so they went ahead without her. Chris claims that when he went back, no, Chris claimed that he went back two times to try to wake his daughter, and even called one of his other daughters on the phone during the time that him and Christy allegedly were in the jacuzzi. He stated that the last time he saw Christy alive was when he went to go back into the home to wake his daughter up for the last time. So, I just found it kind of odd, like, they were getting work done on their showers in the house, so their idea was that they were going to, like, wake up early and bathe in their jacuzzi before the crew came over. I'm assuming because they usually shut off the water when they, like, work on your, your, um, like bathrooms and stuff like that. So it was like the plan that the family had arranged the night before that they would all get up and bathe in the jacuzzi. And then when the crew came, you know, they wouldn't bathe anymore. So that's why he states that he was trying to wake up his daughter because the crew was going to get there around like 7 or 7.30 or 8 o'clock or something or 8.30. So that's kind of how that story starts and why they were in the jacuzzi so early in the morning. I kind of lost my spot. Police arrived on the scene immediately and separated Chris and his daughter and took them down to the station for questioning. His daughter told her side of the story and was released to wait for her father. And also, she began to notify her family. Chris was not immediately released. After telling his side, he was further questioned due to a call that was made by an eyewitness who happened to live next door. Lindsay Patterson was visiting her mother that morning and heard a woman screaming. She described the scream to be very intense and she immediately felt as if something was wrong. That prompted her to investigate and she went into her mother's backyard and saw a man and a woman in a jacuzzi but the woman appeared to be floating in front of the man while he was holding on to her head under the water. At first glance, Lindsay was shocked and felt as if she was peeping in on a sexual act, but the scream she had heard still had her suspicious, so she looked again. This time, the woman could not be seen, seen at all, almost as if she had disappeared, and the husband was sitting back looking very relaxed. Lindsay states that the only, that only a mere seconds occurred between each look, so there was no way that the woman had went inside. Upon seeing that, Lindsay immediately ran inside and called 911. So, she, Lindsay becomes the main eyewitness, obviously, and in her interviews, she states that she heard the scream, she was in the bathroom, she heard the scream, she freaked out. She told her mom, like, hey, what's, what the heck, what's going on? And it was, like, like 6.30 in the morning, so her mom was like, um, it's probably kids playing in the pool. And Lindsay's like, no, it sounds like someone is, like, hurt or something's going on. So that prompted her to look, and they had a cement wall, but I guess there was, like, a hole in the cement wall. And that's what she was looking through. She, like, stood on something to look through, like, a crack or something in the cement wall. So she saw what looked like, you know, the man holding the woman down in his, like, groin region. So, like, he was, like, you know, it looked like they were doing, like, some kind of sexual act. So she immediately looked away. But then it was, like, nah, like, this, this is kind of weird. And she looked again, and that's when she said she saw him, like, sitting back on the jacuzzi, looking, like, relaxed. And she didn't see the woman at all. So thank God that she called the cops because, I mean, she's literally the main witness. Chris was questioned about the witness's testimony and could only offer that she must have not seen what he th what she had thought he even suggested that he had that he did not touch his wife while they were in the jacuzzi and that he felt that she must have slipped and fallen in medical examiners stated that the injuries were grave and had every indication of foul play 
light pointing to the hemorrhaging in the victim's eyes and mouth as well as the lacerations, abrasions, and contusions on her head, face, and arms. There was a possible, there was no possible way that Christy had just slipped and fell in. It was evident that her head had been smashed and that she was struggling while being held down to drown. They even found a hair clip with the lock of her hair at the bottom of a jacuzzi that was evidence of a struggle. So yeah, so she had like some kind of hair clip in her hair and I guess it looked like there was had to be some kind of struggle because it was like ripped out of her hair and it was like floating at the bottom of the, or not floating, it was like it was like sunk at the bottom of the jacuzzi with a clump of her hair like if someone would have slipped and fallen in like that, there's just no way that it looks like it was like pulled out or, you know, some kind of struggle had occurred. With all this evidence, Chris was charged for Christie's murder. He was later released on $1 million bail that was paid by his daughters who got the money once their mother's insurance policy kicked in. During his trial, investigators dug up some shady information about Chris and his time as a police chief, stating that he was often into scamming and shady dealings surrounding money and insurance fraud. So he was a police chief in Idaho, so the fam or so Christy and Chris had moved to Idaho for some time, and I believe the girls too. And during his time there, many of the officers like or hear like would hear him talking reckless and saying that he was gonna do like insurance fraud and you know, fake that he got hurt or like sh get shot and then, you know, claim money so that he wouldn't have to work. Also, he was like, I think he was let go finally for like embezzlement of money. I think it was like $19,000 and he was never charged for any of this. I think they just let him go. So during the trial, they brought forth a lot of shady information about him because at the end of the day, the only people that had actual, like, were actually there was Chris and then the, the eyewitness. So they're just trying to paint a picture that he, like, you know, he was a shady dude and maybe the motive could have been the money, the insurance money. Um, okay, they also brought forth that Christy had been having an affair. So this discovery is something that Chris cl claimed not to know. He said he did not know that his wife was having an affair and everybody else was like shocked by it um, because th obviously that's a motive finding out. They pretty much were trying to paint the picture that Chris must have just got angry at the time, you know, finding out about his wife's affair or whatever. And that is what fueled him to murder her. His daughters and family members all testified in favor of Chris and advocated that he could never do that to Christy and how in love and happy they were. That seemed to work in his favor because the case ended in a long jury. So the jury was not able to decide if he did it or not. The case was later retried and this time they had Christy's brother testify and speak negatively about Chris and his relationship with Christy. And this time Chris was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. So throughout this whole case and the proceedings, the daughters stood by their dad and so did a lot of the family members. They just could not believe that he could have actually did it and you know that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to include their names because I feel like you know they came forward and even their testimonies they were like we know our dad we know our mom and we know that our dad wouldn't do that and um it was just very touchy because there were so many family members that did not believe that you know that could have happened and they you know they were advocating that it was an accident and then you know obviously just being on the outside looking in like me, I automatically assume obviously it's him because the, the evidence and everything kind of leads to him. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's just crazy. Like the medical examiner even said like there was a struggle that, you know, like she didn't just slip and fall and hit her head like the way that her, her head was squashed. It's like as if he would have like squashed her head and then drowned her. So it's just... It's just, I guess, something that 
to me, I, if I was on that jury, you have, you have to have like a, the benefit of the doubt, I forget what they say, like probable doubt or whatever, something, I'm not, I'm not like a lawyer, if you are, let me know, whatever, but I have served jury duty and like, if you're going to convict someone and charge someone with murder, you have to like, have like reasonable doubt, like there, you know, there's always like reasonable doubt, whatever, but like no reasonable doubt, I don't know how to explain that, but, um, I don't know, I probably would have been one that couldn't decide, especially upon hearing the testimonies of the daughters, all the family members, because to me it's like, damn, like I would hate for someone who didn't do something to like go to prison for life, you know, and, um, another thing too, I mean, like, what if it was the lover that did that to her, but then it was, like, such a short time because he's claiming that she actually slipped and fell in when he went inside to get their daughter the last time, so I don't know exactly how much time in between, I don't think he could actually say how much time in between, and then the one thing that I think probably would have swayed me, or swayed, obviously probably swayed people along with the testimonies, or, you know, that probably overruled the testimonies of the family and the daughters is the eyewitness. Like, what does she have to, what does she have to gain from making this up? Especially from what she saw. She didn't see, you know, any, like, um, anything really, like, incriminating other than him holding her head down. But, like, he stated they didn't touch, so why would he be touching her? You know, like, if he had said they were engaged in, like, sexual activity, then that would have gave more like reason to have her seen something like that but it, because he said that they didn't even touch each other there's like no reason for that her to have even seen that unless he really was drowning her um yeah you guys let me know your thoughts i know this was a really quick case um but yeah let me know your thoughts i just kind of wanted to, to give you guys this case because it's just just shocking to me. Um, I do want to say that lately with true crime, I've been having a really hard time because I have a lot of people leaving really rude comments or just they feel as if I'm some kind of expert or something and I'm not. I don't claim to be also making fun of the way I pronounce certain names, especially when they're cases from like other countries and things like that. Um, I literally, English is like my first language, so, or my second language, first language is my second language, so a lot of the times I do have problems with pronouncing certain things, I don't do it on purpose, and I, I'm not perfect, so like lately I just feel like there's just a lot of scrutiny with my true crime ASMR videos, and it's like taking away from me wanting to actually film them, I, although I know a lot of you really do like them, I do have, you know, a lot that I want to film, and I like sharing these random ones that I find, that I find super interesting and unique with you, but just know that I am kind of slowing down a little bit on them just because of a lot of the scrutiny that I've been facing and people leaving rude comments and things like that, so I'm gonna try not to let that get to me, but I, like I said, it's just something that I actually, like, like this case, I actually typed it all up, so it kind of hurts me a little bit when I like take the time to type something up and kind of you know look into it and stuff like that and then someone like completely shoots me down and so yeah so I am sorry um if I'm not gonna be as um regular with true crime but I, I do enjoy it quite a bit in my personal life so I do want to incorporate it into this channel as much as I can okay let me know your thoughts in the comments if you like this video give it a thumbs up and um follow my socials because I post on there when I'm kind of like, I guess, ghost on YouTube. <laughs> Alrighty, I love you all so much. Have a good day. Night.